One reason I'm here is because I, I have a deep fondness for Southwest England because I lived in Devon for a year in the 70s. So it means a lot to me. And also thanks very much to Sarah and Teresa and Anne and everybody else for getting me here. And, and for the, we all prayed to the volcano gods, to Skatipoca, Pele, whoever, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> and I'm, so I was a lot of, lucky to get a lot of help finding and hauling around materials, locating sites, and actually building pieces according to these fuzzy instructions. My collaborators were all volunteers. They were local artists and art workers. We were all in our 20s and 30s, as were most of the artists. By spreading pieces all around the cities and by engaging a youthful art population, I helped to democratize the art on some level, to transform the practice of art making from an elitist activity to a presence in the daily lives of the populations for whom the shows were named. By spreading the work around, and some would say spreading it thin, such a show reaches local people who may have little time or inclination to go to a museum, and it takes tourists into parts of the area they would otherwise never see. Today, no respectable museum show would be executed in such a haphazard and randomly collaborative manner, and no one like me with no curatorial training would be hired to do it, although the dissemination of works throughout an urban setting has become common in the ensuing decades. Places like New Mexico and Cornwall, where continuous occupation over the millennia is so much in evidence, have a peculiar relationship to time and history. Memory is the way we best understand the significance of time through our own lived experience. History is inherited memory, vying with the memories of others, usually at a greater temporal distance, interpreted and reinterpreted over the centuries to become its own peculiar kind of fiction. I'm about now that I've lived in the American West for almost 20 years, I look back and see 1960s earthworks as an urban art, colonizing rural or wilderness or abandoned industrial environments. A lot of city-based artists got very taken with the Western landscape and kind of appropriated it. The images, objects, gain a tremendous amount from the settings, the spaces that surround them, especially as they're seen in photographs. But the social and ecological context remain kind of mysterious. I doubt if such a fuss would be made over Michael Heiser's double negative in Utah from here, if people could see how it now just replicates the harshly gullied land around it, erosion resulting not usually from art, but from deforestation, and overgrazing railroads, and other economic factors. So would any of this be of interest to the international art world? It might be if it were recast in the eyes of a new and critical regionalism. While regionalism has been rele relegated to the attic as parochial and provincial, unless it's adopted by art stars, the art market is always restless, always seeking new forage. In the last couple of decades, there seemed to be more openness to projects dealing with place-related endeavors. And good regional art is not the small picture, as it's always been called, but just another kind of large picture with both roots and reach. I'd still like to see artists getting further and further out into the world like Cluey and many others. I'm still looking for art forms that are buried in social energies not yet recognized as art. It's my 60s roots. If artists frame what we see and how we see, the ultimate frame we need to address is the limitations imposed by society itself and by exhausted notions of art and its functions. Leave it open. I like Tim Collins' alternative. Consider the term interface as an analogy for art a common boundary, the interconnection between systems, concepts, environment, and people. So thanks, and the discussion part is my favorite, so I will discuss.